G'day viewers. In this segment I'm going to talk about streaming real-time media across the internet for Playout. So our topic is really uh, watching videos over the internet or the playback of real-time media. Um, and we're going to do this using uh, the best effort internet as a network service on which to build rather than changing that service. So that means that what I'm talking about now really corresponds to the way that uh, popular sites like uh, be it Coursera, YouTube, Netflix, pick your own favorite one to put in. I'm talking about how all those sites are able to stream video across the internet for you to watch. This is obviously something that's huge network usage in the internet today. And it's interesting for us just to contrast with how um, the Skype case or the VoIP case works because the two are quite different. So let me start there with the two cases of streamed media for playback and interactive media is in a conference call. Um, the stream case is considerably less demanding. Here's the stream case. You can see from the picture it's a little different. I do have the speaker over on the right hand side, but I have simply a file that I'm reading from on the left hand side rather than a live source. Moreover, there is only a single direction to consider. Now in the picture before I looked at a single direction just for simplicity, but there really were two directions and this was an important reason why we needed to minimize the delay so that when you were talking to someone else and they were answering back, the delay was kept low and the network didn't get in the way. Here, we're looking at a single direction, but that's it. There is only this single direction. Given that this is the case, the low delay is really not essential here. It really wouldn't matter if you're, the video you're watching was delayed by a couple of seconds. It would be ruinous for a um, telephone call if it was delayed in only one direction by an extra couple of seconds, but not for your streaming video. It is still generally de desirable to keep the delay low for streaming video, but that's really about affecting the startup so that when you get started, you don't have to wait a long time for the streaming video to commence. Um, it's not about the interactivity. However, because this is a real time playout on the other end, we're still going to need to handle the bandwidth and jitter issues in the network. So let's go on to those issues. As with the interactive case, the hardest thing to handle is really the delay. And here, the key component for us is not so much the delay, but the jitter. So uh, as in the interactive case with VoIP, the, um, the solution to handle the variation in the network delay is to use this playout buffer right here. When media arrives at the receiver, we'll put it in the playout buffer until it's playout time so that we can play it out at a constant rate. This buffering is still needed here to smooth out the variation in network delay. Um, it's not needed, well, I mean, so, so that's its primary purpose, as in the case of the interactive call. There is a difference, however. So let me get to that here on this next slide. Now recall that we are reading the information from a file and sending it across the network. We're not reading it from a live source. That means we can read it as quickly as we can read from the file and send over the network. So if the network has ample bandwidth, we might well find that we're filling up this buffer more quickly than we're playing it out and the buffer is becoming very full. If we were to continue, we would end up buffering perhaps a very large amount of data at the client unnecessarily. So what most media players will have is something called a high watermark. At this high watermark, when the buffer is quite full, they'll simply stop requesting the information from the server and give it a break so it doesn't have to read it out its file and send it across the network. If you stop pulling media at this high level, then the media down here will slowly drain out of the network and will end up going back down, emptying this buffer as we play it out until we reach this low watermark. At that time, that low watermark has a good indication that now you should start asking the server at the other end of the network for more information from the file to put in the buffer. The low watermark shouldn't be at the playout point right at the head of the buffer because obviously it's going to take us a little bit of uh, latency to be able to send off the request and for the answer to come back. So that's why the low watermark will have some space, some buffer space, rather than be right at the front. And similarly, why you would expect a high watermark 
to be somewhere above uh, uh perhaps where you um uh to 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 be somewhere above where you're going to stop making a request because a little bit of information may be coming in in response to your previous requests so we've talked about the delay issue now let's talk about the bandwidth issue often in these streaming video scenarios video can be streamed from a server to many different clients and they have many different uh, kinds of network connections which support different service rates and amounts of bandwidth. So to handle the available bandwidth, it's quite common to have encoded and to send the file in one of a set of encodings. It's possible to encode the same video or voice in several different ways. Choosing higher quality encodings will give you a nicer picture and result, but require more bandwidth. The files will be larger, so they'll require network bandwidth to be uh, more network bandwidth to transfer. Similarly, you could use a lower quality encoding and save more bandwidth. What you can then do is select the best encoding which will fit across the network given the available bandwidth. Just to give you an example of how that works, I've shown you some pictures uh, that show um, the variation in quality versus size for JPEG encoding. JPEG is all about a still image. For video this would be MPEG or something else, but it's just easiest to show you a JPEG example. The same analogous procedure is used with video. So on the left here we have a high quality and you can see 15 to 1 is the compression ratio, so we've uh, greatly compacted the picture. It still looks really good though. As we go down 23 to 1, 46 to 1, you might not even be able to see any difference at 20 3 to 1. At 46 to 1, at least on my screen, there are some blocking artifacts appearing here. And by the time we get to 144 to 1, this is like horrible. I wouldn't want to watch it. Don't know about you. Horrible. However, it is almost 10 times smaller than the original high quality one. So you can see here we can choose a trade off point that's going to have the best quality we can handle for um, the amount of bandwidth which we have available to the client at the other end. And as internet video has been used more and more over time and technology progresses, we've tended to use larger and better quality pictures that will fit. And now in some cases you can download and, and stream high definition TV movies rather than the standard definition or small versions. So what else is a little different about the streaming media case than the interactive conferencing case. Well, one thing that is quite different is just the transport protocol we can use to get the information there. In particular, should we stream over TCP or UDP? This is a, um, a bit of a funny question in that most of us, at least uh, uh, networking researchers, are used to thinking of um, real-time information as being synonymous with the usage of UDP. If you use UDP, it's just a glorified packet, so this is a great way to minimize the message delay. And that's what you would want to use for interactive real-time sessions like your Skype calls. However, for streaming, it turns out that TCP is typically used for sending information, even though it will have a larger delay. It will generally have a larger delay because if anything's lost, TCP will go back and get it, before releasing the information that comes after that. So it may look like your information delivery suddenly stops for a while and then continues. So the delay can be larger, sometimes quite a lot larger. Well, whereby a lot is um, uh, seconds or subseconds, um, not, uh, not minutes. So it's not really a lot larger by the scale at which we watch videos of the length of videos. But TCP is very popular today for streaming media rather than UDP for several reasons. The first is that, as I've been saying here, the load delay is not as essential. It's useful to keep it low to be able to start the video quickly after you hit click, get the information to begin playing, enough in your buffer to handle the variation delay and begin playing. But, you know, as long as it's fairly low, it'll be okay. It has the benefits that loss recovery is simplified. Uh, TCP is handling the loss recovery, so we don't have to worry about it as part of presenting the media. So we'll never have to skip over some uh, missing, um, missing slides in the presentation or fill in a little bit of audio with just some white noise or something like that. 
Moreover, in terms of deployment, TCP, and if you, especially if you're using HTTP, HTTP on top of it, it's very easy to deploy because it generally passes through people's firewalls and NAT boxes and everything quite easily. So it's um, the, the internet is really set up for it. So it's easier to be able to deploy it everywhere than it is to use UDP. Okay, so uh, just to complete our picture of streaming media, what I would like to do is talk about the other components that are missing. We've talked about the delivery of real-time information. I've told you that it's mostly done with TCP, but you're still going to use a playout buffer, just with high and low watermarks. But there's a little more to streaming media players. We've mostly talked about this. Now, and we've talked a little bit about the media transport, just with TCP or UDP. What we haven't talked about yet is the signaling. We still need some way to set it up. Um, you know, usually you will set up a call or you'll set up a streaming media session before the server can just suddenly black all of the video data down. We need a little bit of call overhead for signaling. And I want to say a little bit more about the media transport to go beyond TCP or UDP and talk about protocols on top, application protocols, which you use for streaming media. And really I'm going to say a little bit about the use of HTTP and a protocol called RTSP. I'm not going to say too much, however. Um, you will have the basic ideas already in understanding how to adapt to different levels of bandwidth and jitter. And this is actually a very fast evolving area. In fact, the HTML, HTML5 standard now includes a video player. So everyone's going to have to work out how to uh, get uh, video to that player now that it's almost a standard part of the web. And the protocols which cause this to happen are all evolving and there are different proprietary protocols and they'll be standardized more over time. And finally, just before I go over a couple of ways to deliver the media, I want to point out that I'm really talking about the streaming of media to an individual party. That's the way it mostly works in the internet today, where um, we use something like a CDN to get the media close to all of the viewers and then individual sessions between a CDN node, or CDN replica rather, and the nearby viewers. There are other advantages to be had if we're all watching, say, a live event at the same time. But while they're interesting things, I'm not going to go into them in this video. Okay, so let's look at these two alternatives for just some of the higher layer protocols for putting all of the pieces together. One way that you can stream video is with a protocol called RTSP. This is a design which used to be fairly popular. And uh, in, in this sort of system, you, would, um, you were able to tie media player into your web viewing. What would happen is you typically click on a link where a video was mentioned in your web player. And what this would do is it would start the process by getting, using HTTP, a meta file describing the video. So that's this request. You run a web page and someone clicks and then you make an HTTP request for the video and you get it back. Now, the HTTP response doesn't actually contain the video. This might be a gigabyte or something and uh, you don't want to transfer all of that before beginning to look at it. It really contains a meta file. It, uh, and the meta information is typically um, that uh, the protocol used to play out the video is with RTSP. So you might have seen URLs with the form RTSP colon slash slash and then other information about what server to contact and what the file name is. At this stage, the browser hands off an RTSP URL to the media player. The media player, if this is um, RTSP, will then send a media request and set up a session and do the negotiation with the media server and then all of your media response will come back, whether it's via TCP or UDP, um, often as RTP uh, information carried over those two. And at this stage we'll have the usual playout buffer technique and we'll be done. So RTSP here is really the protocol which is to use to do the call signaling with the media server and to pull all of the information over. Um, stopping when you reach the high watermark and resuming when you reach the low watermark. Here's a different way, a completely different way of streaming media. And I'm mentioning this other way of streaming media using simply the existing web protocols, HTTP, 
because this method of delivering streaming media is the method that has become quite popular nowadays and is widely used for streaming media clients. It's, uh, it's supplanting all of the RTSP methods. The method here is that you simply use HTTP really. The first step is to use an HTTP request uh, to simply get some of the meta information. This is an index. So you can see here I have the get request and then the information that comes back as part of the HTTP response is going to be the index. That's going to really give you a list, if you like, of many, many, many different HTTP URLs which could be got, each of which is going to contain a small amount of the video uh, at a different time step and in different encodings. What your browser will, what your video player will then do is make many HTTP requests, each of which will get a small bit of the information, then put it in the playout buffer for playout. And so you can see that's why there's a get media request. And they just keep going and media is returned. Now, in addition to simply getting some media for the first second, for the second second, for the third second, and putting them all in the playout buffer so they can be played out, your uh, media player will need to make decisions as to what kind of encoding a video to get. The server might have half a dozen different encodings of video at different bit rates. So the media player will, uh, will adapt the choices of what quality of media it gets for each different time instant. And it can do that based on just the past history of buffer occupancy. If it's getting low quality video and it's pulling in, in quickly and it's getting ahead of when it needs to be played out, it might decide to get higher quality video, which will come in a little more slowly because it's in terms of time because it's larger. Um, but if you can play a higher quality video, it's generally better. So your media player will be responsible for adapting between there. And you can see I've tried to indicate a thicker line here. So we'll just call it higher quality, higher Q. So maybe that was a, um, uh, a second of video just at a higher quality than before because the media player has decided it's the way to go. So this is the method which has been worked out right now and used for video players on the internet. The standards are evolving and you could look up something called DASH, which I think stands for Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. Um, Apple has proprietary versions, Adobe has proprietary versions, Netflix has proprietary versions and so on and they're all beginning to be standardized. This system is interesting because it very much fits into the existing web protocols. We're really just using HTTP here to knit everything together just with a media player as output. That media player can be embedded as part of our web browser, especially with HTML5. This is also quite good on the server end. So this is the server, and this is the client. It's quite good on the server end too because the server is really just another HTTP server, another web server. It's not maintaining call state for the client. This client is really just pulling the bits of video it needs. This makes it quite easy if the client, for instance, wants to skip around to the other end of the video. As long as it's got the index, it will know what to ask for and it'll be able to jump to that end and the web server really doesn't have to care about where the, what client it's talking to and where they are. It will need to uh, uh, check the request just to make sure you're allowed to watch this video but other than that it can give you a video from anywhere in the in the movie. Okay and now we're done when you put these pieces together you see how the information can be transferred uh, for streaming media and we use the same kind of variation of a playout buffer to be able to play it out in real time.